Reverend uh, Sergi. Oh. Perfect. Or the Reverend Sergi, as it says in the biography, though. <laughs> anyway. Yes. We have one announcement to make, that is that the social engineering panel will also be simulcast down in the movie area on the second floor. Uh, it can get a little crowded, so if you want to go down there and check it out in air-conditioned splendor, feel free. It's already smelling a little bad with the crowd over there, seeing Jello now, so, uh, you know, use your better judgment. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Gonzo. Well, thanks for the applause. I see the checks got to everyone. So, has everyone been having a good time so far? That's it? <laughs> Don't scream that loud, man. Just bring feds in here. What's the matter with you? So, let's talk some technology. Non-lethal technology. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk about electromagnetic pulse bombs. I'm sure that's going to bring the DOD guys in here, too. Uh, it's similar to, uh, I guess, for those of us who've seen The Matrix when they had the, the squiggles and they had to shoot that pulse off to kill it. It's similar to that in some ways, but I'll go into the whole military applications of it and, and what Big Brother has done with it. So the effects of it, uh, well, it was first noted, uh, it was in World War II during some high-altitude nuclear weapons testing. And it was marked, uh, it was a result, it was a short, uh, well, it was hundreds of nanoseconds, and it was an intense electromagnetic pulse burst that will radiate out from a point of an impact, uh, getting weaker and weaker as it goes out. And uh, well, it'll, it's strongest around point of impact, uh, but what it'll do is it'll make varying fields of voltage, kilovolts, on anything that's exposed electrically, copper wiring, uh, railway signals, even some parts of automobiles uh, are subject to it. So what makes it so important for the military to use is that in the end you can fry just about any type of electrical equipment that you want, radios, anything. And given how it's, you know, uh, the strength of the electromagnetic pulse and its durability of equipment, you know, you can end up like, literally losing just about everything for, you know, for whatever you've got going with it. Uh, the damage itself is similar to actually uh, of a lightning strike, and I've got a transparency I'll show everyone. It shows uh, what a spike is like when it hits. So uh, some commercial computer equipment is especially at risk because of the amount of the metal oxide semiconductors on it, or MOS devices. Uh, and because you don't really need a lot of energy to destroy them, and you know, they're, they're cheaper to use in mass quantities. So that really puts us all at risk for it. Uh, and what it'll happen is it causes a gate breakdown, uh, and that's what it cause uh, like when there's any excess of tens of voltage, and it'll actually cause physical hardware to break down. That's the gate breakdown. Uh, and if it's not strong enough to cause any thermal damage, uh, the power supplies in the equipment will still create enough energy to further that pulse, and you're still going to get fried from it anyway. So when the damage equipment can still be reliable, uh, the shielding of the equipment still doesn't provide a full defense because any cables or exposed copper wiring is going to act as an antenna. And it'll fuel any electromagnetic pulse into it. It'll take whatever you've got out. Well, uh, let's see. So the technological base for it, uh, there's a lot to it. Most of it went over my head, you know, because I'm not into science and math. That's why I majored in English. So I wouldn't have to figure out half of this. Uh, but it's been around for a while. Uh, and the important stuff in this area, it's explosively pumped flux compression generators, not to be confused with a flux capacitor, <laughs> by the way, uh, propellant or any explosive uh, magnetic hydrodynamic or MHD generators, and a range of uh, the HPM devices. The one that's leading in that area is a virtual cathode oscillator, or more commonly known as a vercator. Uh, and there's a number of experimental designs that have been tested on it, and there's a lot of work that shows about it. You can just, just do a Google on it, and it'll come up. So what it looks like, uh, when I mentioned that transparency before. If everyone, uh, all right, can you all see that all right? 
All right. So the colors show the spike on it. On the, the nuclear EMP, the, the transient is the, the red one. The green one, as I mentioned about the, you know, the lightning strike, right here going down. And the flux compression generator, purple one, it goes up and it'll just drop. All right, so let's talk about the explosively pumped compression generators. All right, uh, it's old technology related to the bomb designs. Uh, the first one actually was shown by Clarence Fowler uh, at Los Alamos National Labs uh, in the late 50s. Uh, and since that time, there have been a number of designs that have been built, tested here. Russia's got them, a uh, number of other countries as well. Uh, the, and what it'll do is it'll produce electrical energy. Uh, it's a number of megajoules and tens of hundreds of, of microseconds in a tight compressed shot uh, and no, I don't know how much a megajoule is, but from what I understand, it's, it's up there. Uh, the power levels are actually uh, measured in terawatts to tens of terawatts. And the FCGs can be used uh, directly or as a one-shot pulse power from microwave tubes. So to give an idea of how strong it is, uh, power produced by a large FCG is anywhere between 10 to 1,000 times greater than a lightning strike. So and the idea behind it is to use a fast explosive quickly to compress magnetic fields. And it takes a lot of the energy from the explosive into that field. The initial uh, field in it, uh, before the explosion, is produced by a start charge. And that works because uh, it's made available by an external source, a high voltage capacitor bank, or a Marx bank, uh, a smaller FCG or an MHD device. In theory, any device that can create current uh, in tens of kiloamps to megaamps it will be proper for the use. A variety of different patterns are available, but uh, the most common of them are coax uh, CFGs. And it stands out because it's basic uh, cylindrical and it leads itself for munitions packing. So uh, let's talk about the, the explosively pumped coax generator. A typical generator uh, like that, it's a copper tube uh, and it's the armature uh, the two, it's filled with a fast, high-order explosive, such as B and C types, for you poor man James Bond fans there, uh, to blocks of PBX9501. And the armature itself is surrounded by a, a helical coil, usually copper, and that makes uh, the FCG uh, stator. And the stator's winding, in some designs, is actually segmented with uh, other wires, bifurcating the ends of the segments to best use the inductance on the coil. So the strong forces uh, made during that operation could theoretically disintegrate the device if not cut off quickly. So, and it's usually done by adding some kind of jacket of something that's non-magnetic uh, and the materials like fiberglass or concrete in a matrix of epoxy uh, will take care of that. In theory, it's like any proper mechanical or electrical properties can be used in areas where weight is an issue such as a Mitchell warhead or a uh, you know, an air-delivered bomb, Kevlar or glass epoxy composite could be used as well. And, you know, it's typical uh, that the explosive is going to detonate when the current peaks. And it's usually done with an explosive lens plane wave generator, which makes a uniform plane wave burn or detonation in front of the explosive. After that, the wave of the explosion itself will spread through the coil, actually forcing it into a conical shape anywhere between 12 to 14 degrees of arc where the armature is going to be expanded to the full diameter of the coil itself, making a short circuit between the ends of the coil, shorting and isolating the start current source, and trapping the current within the hardware itself. The spreading short has the effect, uh, like it'll, it'll tighten the magnetic field and reduce the inductance of the coil. So such generators like that, it'll make a ramping current pulse, which will peak before disintegration. And th there's other results that show, like the ramp times and you know where it peaks and where it'll drop and all that. The ratio of the output current itself, uh, it's gained according to design. And, and there is variance in it depending on who makes it. Uh, numbers as high as 60 have been seen. And in other applications uh, where weight and space are concerned, the smallest you know, obviously is going to be the best. And the applications can exploit a cascading of the FCGs. Uh, whereas the primer, uh, it'll actually be the start current. And it's been backed up with experiments uh, done at, at various national labs, Los Alamos being one of them. 
So uh, the main concerns in adjusting anything uh, in that for a weapons application lies actually in the packaging because the start current supply uh, matching to the unit of extended load. And connecting to a load is simply, uh, it's just the coax geometry and the conical designs. More importantly, uh, it's available for weapons where FCGs can be stacked axially with devices such as a microwave vercator. And uh, the needs of the load, uh, such as that, in terms of timing and waveform shape, can take care of uh, inserting transformers, pulse shaping networks, and other explosive high current switches. So now to drive that, you need some kind of explosive. So the design for that, uh, it's, uh, it's an explosive driven magneto hydrodynamic. Uh, it's a younger form of the FCG. Technical issues, uh, like the ways in the site, uh, the size of it, again, are a concern. Uh, you know, but it, it seems to be that uh, the MHD devices themselves only play a small role into where this is gonna go in the future. And the main principle behind it is that, the, uh, that a conductor moving through a magnetic field will make an electrical current opposite the direction of the field of the conductor motion. So in a propellant or explosive driven device like that, the conductor is, is plasma of ionized propellant gas and it'll force it through the magnetical field and the current is gathered by the electrodes uh, which are in contact with that plasma stream. And the properties of it are best used when you see the propellant with a proper additive that'll ionize during the burn. So experiments uh, have been done that shows a number of propellant gases used in conventional ammunition propellant as a base. Cartridges um, of such propellant can be loaded like regular artillery rounds for multiple shots. So for a tactical setting, you know, draw your own conclusions. Uh, the Vercator itself um, has some of the FCGs that are a potent technology base, because uh, you know, obviously for it being so strong, and the output of itself, of its base physics, is restricted to frequencies below one megahertz. So many targets are gonna be difficult to hit, you know, even with a high power at such frequencies. So aiming the energy from that, you know, it's gonna be a problem. But the high power uh, device itself t will take care of both of the problems because the output power can be tightly condensed and it'll have a, a better ability to take on both energy into the targets. So, and there's a number of these that exist. Uh, you know, again, do a Google, you'll see it. Slow wave devices, magnetrons, relativistic, uh, klystrons, are some of the names for them. And uh, well, the Vercator itself is interesting because it's only a one shot unit, but it'll produce you know, that very strong, powerful single pulse. But mechanically, it's very compact. So you, know, you can do all kinds of uh, applications with it. Uh, and it can function over a number of microwave frequencies as well. So uh, the physics behind that itself, it's a lot more complex. Uh, but basically, the vercator itself, it, you're speeding current through an electron beam against a mesh of some kind of foil anode. And the electrons will pass through the anode, making a bubble space, and it'll put the charge behind the current. You know, so and, uh, you'll get a lot of the electrons that'll actually pass through it, uh, you know, and under the right conditions, it'll actually uh, make it oscillate at the, at the said uh, microwave frequencies. So the space itself is put into a resonant cavity, which it's properly tuned, very high peak powers can be made. Uh, and regular microwave engineering techniques have been shown that, that it does work. Uh, and as an aside to it too, it's, uh, no, well, that's not relevant. That's too complex for this, no, at least in this setting. Uh, but it'll go into uh, like the power levels It'll range from 170 kilowatts to over 40 gigawatts over uh, numerous frequencies uh, of decimetric and the centimetric bands. And two most common configurations of the vercator and the axial vercator, uh, I'll call them the AV and the TV. Uh, the, well, the AV in its simplest, um, it's, it's cylindrical, uh, it's a waveguide structure. And the power is extracted by changing the waveguide to a conical horn which will function as the antenna. Uh, and the AVs usually oscillate in a transverse magnetic, or TM, mode. And uh, the transverse vercator will inject a cathode current from the side of the cavity, and it'll oscillate in the transverse electric mode. 
So uh, the concerns with that, uh, it's that the design, uh, it's, it's output during pulse duration, which is usually of the order in a microsecond. And it's restricted uh, by the node itself actually melting. The stability of the frequency that it'll oscillate at, and that's compromised by the cavity mode hopping, uh, conversion efficiently in, in uh, the power output. Now the power efficiency from it, uh, it, it's appropriate for a selected antenna type and it can be a concern given the high power levels uh, and the potential for electric breakdown in, in insulators. So the lethality of it, uh, it's, it's pretty complex. Unlike a regular technological base for web and construction, uh, which, you know, for more reference on that, there's a number of publicly made documents for it. Uh, the lethality, uh, it's been reported uh, much less frequently. And the calculation of uh, the electromagnetic field, uh, it's the strength of it are attainable at certain radii for a target. Uh, that straightforward job determining kill probability for a target isn't always set. So, and, but there's good reasoning behind this. That's because the targets are varied in their durability, uh, you know, if they're shielded properly, anything like that. And uh, the equipment that's been protected uh, against the attack, well, it'll take uh, a number of varieties uh, of the magnitude greater field strengths than the standard of commercially rated equipment. So more importantly, uh, various manufacturers uh, issuing of the similar types of equipment can vary a lot in hardness due to the variables in the electrical designs, cabling systems, shielding designs, et cetera. And the second problem is in figuring out the lethality of the coupling efficiency, uh, which it's a measure of how much power is transferred from the field uh, made by the weapon into the target. So only power coupled into the target can do the damage or any useful damage. Uh, so now when you get the coupling modes uh, and how it actually goes into the targets, there's two principles behind it. There's a front door coupling uh, that will usually happen when power from, from an EMP is set off and it's coupled into the antenna associated with the communications or radar, let's say. And the antenna is designed uh, to couple the power in and out of the equipment and it provides a good path for the power flow uh, from the weapon and that's where you get all that damage. Now backdoor coupling happens when the electromagnetic field from a weapon makes large transient currents, uh, better known as spikes. When made by low frequency uh, or electrical standing waves uh, made by a high power device like that or a fixed wiring cables uh, providing uh, connections to main power or a telephone network. So equipment connected to anything exposed will experience uh, the transient spikes or standing waves which can damage the power supplies uh, and if they're not uh, guarded properly. So the, a low frequency weapon, uh, it'll couple well into regular wiring uh, due to the fact that most phone lines, data lines and all that, uh, building corridors, apartment buildings, you know, because it's all exposed. So in most cases, uh, any particular cable, it'll, you know, leave everything open because uh, it's joined at approximate right angles. Uh, so whatever the relative familiarization of the weapons field, more than one linear segment of the cable run itself, it's going to be oriented in such a way that good coupling can be gotten. Well, it's also worth noting uh, the safe operation uh, envelopes of some common types of the semiconductor devices because the breakdown ratings uh, for silicon, high frequency bipolar transients, uh, you'll find those most often in your radio transmitters, things like that, will vary between 15 to 65 volts. So um, the gallium arsenide feel effect transistors are usually rated between 10 volts. So the high density DRAM is essential for many computers and it's rated to 7 volts. Generic CMOS logic has a rating of between 7 and 15 volts. Microprocessors running off a 3.3 or 5 volt power supply uh, is related close to that voltage. And modern devices or equipment with uh, added circuits to each pin sink, uh, the, the static discharge, and steady employment of a high voltage will get past that. So communications interfaces, power supplies, uh, that has to meet some kind of standard requirements. And interfaces like that are usually protected by isolation transformers that will have a rating from hundreds of volts to about two or three kilovolts. So it's obvious that once defense is made available by a transformer, a cable pulse arrestor or shielding is bypassed, 
uh, voltage as low as 50 volts can do a lot of damage to the equipment. So the high power magnetic weapons functioning in the centimetric uh, bands and other, uh, well on the other hand, an additional coupling process to backdoor coupling. And that's the ability to couple directly into the equipment through ventilation holes, space between panels and poorly guarded interfaces. In these situations, uh, anything going into the equipment is going to act like a slot in the microwave cavity, leading uh, more microwave radiation into the center of that cavity. The radiation is going to form a spatial standing wave pattern. Uh, the components in the antinodes within the standing wave are openly high electromagnetic fields. Due to the fact that so many microwave weapons can couple easier than low frequency weapons, and in many cases get around safety devices that'll stop devices, uh, you know, made to stop that. The microwave weapons do have the ability to be much more lethal than low frequency weapons. And research has been done in this area. It shows a difficulty in producing a workable model for guessing equipment vulnerability, but it does show a solid model for protecting equipment. The variety of a likely target in the unknown, geometrical layout, uh, and the electrical details of the wiring and cabling infrastructure surrounding it uh, you know, it makes exact prediction impossible, but there have been formulas drawn up for it. So a basic approach of dealing with it, uh, you know, this is relating uh, to backdoor coupling, is to figure out known lethal voltage levels and then use this to find out the needed field strength to generate the voltage. And once that's figured out, a lethal radius for a given weapon configuration can be made. So like a minor example of that uh, is, a, it's, well, it's that from 10 gigs to a five gigahertz high power device showing a footprint of 400 to 500 meters in diameter to a distance of a few hundred meters. And that'll result in field strengths of some kilovolts per meter within the footprint. And it's able of making hundreds of volts uh, to kilovolts on exposed wires or cables. And that hints at a lethal radii of hundreds of meters depending on the weapon's performance and target's defenses. So uh, to maximize the lethality, the first thing to do is to top out at the peak power and duration of the radius of the weapon. So for a certain bomb size, this is done by using the most powerful flux compression generator and the vericator in an HPM bomb, which will obviously fit the size. And energy not emitted is wasted energy at the cost of lethality. Uh, lethality. Next is maximizing coupling efficiency to the target set. And a good way to deal with a complex and varied target is uh, just use every chance of coupling available in that weapon's bandwidth. A low frequency bomb built around uh, an FCG will need a big antenna to supply the good power coupling to the surrounding environment of the weapon. And weapons made this way are inherently wideband since most of the power produced made in it uh, is below one megahertz and the small antennas just aren't an option for that. One possibility is for a bomb getting close to its firing altitude to send out five linear inteller, um, antenna elements and that's done by ejecting spools of cable, which will unwind hundreds of meters in length. Uh, so four radial antennas, uh, it'll form a, a, a virtual earth plane surrounding the bomb itself, while an axial element can create the power form of the FCJ. So the selection of the element lengths uh, would be needed to properly match the frequency and to make the, the proper field. A high power uh, is needed to match the low impedance of FCG output. Um, and that's because the higher impedance of the antenna, making sure the current doesn't pulse, you know, because you can fry the cable early if it's not timed right. And uh, there are a ton, uh, other alternatives to that. One is to just guide the bomb close to the target itself and count one, uh, and count on a near field made by the FCG winding, which is just a loop antenna with a small diameter related to the, the bandwidth. So coupling uh, isn't the best, and the use of the bomb uh, that is guided would let a more accurate hit be made. So an area worth looking in a further in the sense of that uh, would is like damage or destroying magnetic tape libraries, you know, since the fields near a flux generator are of the type, uh, you know, that, that's uh, whatever frequency it'll damage the, the microwave tapes. I'm not, I'm not sure the exact frequencies either. But, uh, but the microwave bombs themselves have a wider range of uh, coupling modes against the small wavelength uh, and it can be focused against targets with a compact antenna. And I've got a, another picture of it here of, of, uh, you know, of what the whole antenna vercator assembly looks like.
All right, so everyone can see that all right? Yeah, so that's it. Uh, let's see, so where you see it coming through on this side, there's the reflector, the axial vercator that I mentioned before, uh, the antenna feed ports. All right, uh, see the backfire reflector, the multifilier, the whole helical assembly, and the polarized uh, radiation. Let's see, and there it is, and that's the wave itself emitted from it. All right, so targeting for it, uh, it's it's easy to determine because um, you know, there's uh, so many things that are uh, you know, that are able to be used, and I don't mean always in a military sense. If a government wanted to act against its people, you know, cripple the infrastructure, take out all of their internet service, phones, electricity, everything. And uh, the targets, uh, you know, and it's also good uh, because it's geographically fixed. And so, you know, it's going to make air attack uh, the best way to do it. So the accuracy for it, uh, it's programmed uh, because of GPS and uh, it's camouflaged and the mobile targets uh, well, that'll, uh, that'll radiate openly. So relocatable and mobile air defenses, uh, mobile communication nodes, naval vessels, and they're all examples of certain targets. When radiating, their positions can be tracked with, with a suitable electronic support measures, ESM, I'll call them, um, and ELS, emitter locating systems that are carried either by the launch platform or remote surveillance platform. With uh, the aforementioned surveillance platform, the target coordinates uh, are constantly linked to the launch platform. And most of the targets like that move pretty slow and they're not able to get out of, out of uh, the EMP's footprint in time. So hidden uh, targets, mobile targets, which won't openly radiate, um, can be a problem, especially if regular means of targeting are being used. So a targeting solution uh, to this is finding and tracking uh, of unintentional emission, UE, I'll call it, uh, and that's gained most attention in the sense of tempest surveillance of all things, where roaming emanations uh, leaking from poorly shielded equipment can be spotted, and in many cases can be demodulated to get a useful uh, piece of information out of it. Uh, and it's called Van Eck radiation. So if you're familiar with Van Eck freaking, you know, so that you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and such missions like that can be guessed, uh, they can be best kept down with proper uh, controls and there, there are uh, controlled techniques. I'll show another uh, transparency about that in a bit. So demodulating uh, the whole uh, UE, it's difficult uh, to take care of that and targeting of EMP bombs because it doesn't present the problem. So targeting an emitter for an attack it needs only to determine the type of emission, target type, and isolate its position. And that's because of the fact that the computer monitor emissions, peripherals, and any processing equipment, switch modes, uh, internal combustion systems, duty cycle controllers, um, thyristor triassic based, um, heterodyne receivers, you know, things like that. And they all have their own frequencies and modulations. And it just, you know, it makes it that much easier. It's not just a block of frequencies they look at. Everyone can be picked out and dealt with. So I was like, during the Vietnam War, in fact, uh, it was used when gunships uh, went out at night and they were using direction uh, finding receivers to find emissions from vehicle enemy ignition emissions. And once uh, found, uh, the vehicle would be attacked. So now UE happens uh, at a pretty low level. And the use of that method for detection uh, before any incidents can be difficult to use because it might be needed to actually fly over the target itself and start uh, tumbling for frequencies. So the use of drones uh, are going to be used more in that. Now actually getting the bomb there, it's similar to a regular explosive warhead and it's filled to a certain amount of space and it has a given mass determined by whatever hardware they're using inside of it. Uh, and the existing employments that are there now, uh, now, well, I'm sure there's there's probably more that had this because the info I have, it's a couple of years old. Uh, but it, it involves uh, fitting warhead to a cruise missile's airframe, but the frame itself is going to restrict the weapon's weight to about 750 pounds or 340 kilograms for our European friends. And some restrictions in fuel capacity could see the size increased. So a restriction of all uses uh, is the need to carry a, a power supply given to the current 
to charge the capacitors that are used to prime the FCG before it actually goes off. So the payload will then be balanced between storage and the weapon itself. And the weapon, like a cruise missile, uh, the size of the priming current source, as well as a battery, can impose a restriction on the weapon's ability. Because air-delivered bombs having a flight time of tens of seconds to minutes could be built to boost the launching aircraft power systems. And in such a design, the bomb's capacitor uh, band can be powered up by the aircraft on its way to the target. And after release, a smaller onboard power supply can take over and keep the charge going at, at a certain level. So an EMP bomb delivered by regular aircraft, uh, it'll, it'll offer a better ratio of, uh, of, you know, like of total uh, annihilation in some cases uh, because the mass of it can be committed uh, to an EMP device installation itself. So if that's the case, a given technology for an EMP bomb of identical mass to an electromagnetic equipment uh, or an electromagnetic equipped missile can be more lethal and can assume greater accuracy of delivery uh, and technologically similar electromagnetic device design. So a missile with an electromagnetic warhead installation will make up the EMP uh, device an energy converter and an onboard storage unit, like a battery, are obviously needed. And as the weapon is charged, the battery is drained. So the electromagnetic device will be off by the missile's onboard fusing system, and it'll be connected to the navigation system in the cruise missile. And an anti-shipping missile, uh, let's, I, I shouldn't have used the term anti-shipping, but it, it's meant for any naval craft. Uh, the radar seeker uh, and, and anything that's air-to-air -air missile uh, is the proximity fusing system, and the ratio of payload mass to launch mass is anywhere between 15 to 30 percent. So an EMP bomb's warhead uh, that'll make up an electromagnetic device, uh, an energy converter, and a bomb to charge the whole device after leaving the platform, uh, the fusing could be furnished by a radar altimeter fuse to detonate the bomb in the air. Barometric fuse, or in some cases even GPS-guided bombs, the system's navigation. The warhead ratio can be as high as 85%, with most of the good mass being occupied by the electromagnetic device and supporting hardware. So because of the large, potentially lethal radius of the device, uh, you know, it's, uh, well, let me see here. Okay, I think I just killed a fly. Uh, in relation to an explosive device of a similar mass, standoff delivery would be better. This is an inherent characteristic of the weapons, like a cruise missile, but possibly uh, the use of that device for guide bombs, anything against air-to-air -air missiles, it's going to dictate fire and, for, and uh, forget guidance of the right variety to let the launching aircraft get a good distance of a few miles before detonation. So GPS guidance uh, for weapons has meant good guidance for little cost, while the GPS weapons without a differential GPS add-on uh, it might not have dead on accuracy, but they're accurate to within 40 feet. So in recent years, the Air Force has done a number of things with it. Uh, and the importance of that means uh, that as a form of delivery for it, uh, there's three benefits. The first being that the guide bomb can be let go from outside the effective radius, reducing risk to the aircraft. Second, uh, the large standoff means that the aircraft can be well aware, uh, well, well away from the effects of the bombs. And third, the bomb's autopilot can be programmed to form the terminal trajectory of the weapon so the target can be engaged from a, a better angle. And the big advantage of using EMP bombs is that they can be delivered by any tactical aircraft with a nav attack system that's it, that has GPS equipment. So if weapon ballistic properties are the same to a standard weapon, no software changes need to be made. Uh, to the EMP bombs, and it's simple in comparison to weapons like ARM, anti-radiation uh, munitions, uh, and that's due to low-cost manufacturing support, and that it can be expected that there's going to be a greater number of these um, used in the future. So in that sense, it's worth being aware of the Air Force's possession of the JDAM-capable F-117A and the B-2A, and the ability to deliver the EMP bombs against high-profile targets. So, defensive measures. There. 
Yeah, so um, if any of you have seen um, the movie Enemy of the State, where they made a reference to copper shielding being inside the walls, that was a, a takeoff on this. Yeah, there it is. And so and, uh, when I'm done, if any of you want to come up and take a look at this, that's, that's fine. Uh, so on the, the limitations of the weapons, uh, it's determined by the usage, uh, and it, it does restrict accuracy. But the weapon best used to destroy solid state computers and the receivers. Uh, it'll cause little or no damage, uh, such as anything that's Cold War, Russian military equipment, anything from when Germany was split in half, etc. So, uh, and that points out limiting the radiation. It's difficult uh, you know, to, to determine a kill assessment because uh, radiating targets like radar or communications equipment can continue to radiate after an attack, even after their data processing systems have been killed. So it means that some equipment might can, uh, may be able to still suffer an attack and continue working. On the flip side of that, uh, any emitters that are shut down before an attack may not show damage right away. So and I've also I've got another transparency here for you know, what this is. Uh, it's a strategic air attack model. So when one of these are delivered, man, that is shitty res. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, so you want to go for the leadership, the, the computer networks first, and it'll radio out machinery, uh, the railing signals for railroads. It'll be a cascading effect. Because once the leadership's taken out, everything else will just go right, pretty much, if yeah. not right away, eventually. And ultimately, it'll go down to the field troops for their even just simple two-way radios. So, now I know Big Brother has been really toying with this. So you might want to take a note on this and look it up later. Uh, but there are a number of executive orders uh, that were signed a while ago. Uh, and it was combined into Executive Order 11004. Uh, that's all well, that's part of it. Uh, and that'll provide for the Housing Finance Authority to relocate communities and designate areas. So if, let's say, government were to move against its people and wanted to make sure they were staying out of there, why not fry everything they own? And all of it was also combined into another uh, executive order that Richard Nixon had signed. And, uh, you know, and even now, you know, all of us are aware of the problems that are coming down the road. And this is one I just, I just came across and wanted to point out because it does put the whole hacker community at risk because we stand to lose everything. So here's Sergi. I, I'm going to say something first, and if we have time, Leo's going to talk about uh, her weaponry. But I decided to come in right now because uh, Leo's and Gonzo's material deals with anti-infrastructure uh, weaponry. Uh, all of it, obviously, since it's not directed against personnel, uh, it's not directly legal, though, if you destroy the life support systems, such as well, agriculture, transportation, uh, power, and communications things of that sort eventually it will lead to casualties. However, uh, right now what I'm going to talk about is non-lethal uh, anti-personnel technology, not just the kind that can be used during uh, warfare, but also um, when policing. A lot of times police want to get their uh, suspect without damaging him, without hurting him in any way or killing him, as may be the case in some unfortunate situations. Now, one of the most interesting devices that I've come across is a tetanus ray developed by a company called HSV Technologies. They have a website at hsvt.org in case anyone wants to check it out. Uh, I'll also give you the patent number later, but first I'd like to mention the predecessors of uh, this technology, which are actually being also presently developed. They're uh, being parallelly they're being developed in parallel to this technology, and they're, uh, they're manifestations of taser technology, in case anyone does not know what that is. It involves just cranking up a high voltage current, a high voltage low amperage current through a human body, which basically just stuns the human being or animal, as it's used on cattle in some cases. Um, 
the Air Force and I believe the Army have developed vehicle-mounted tasers, tasers which could be used against mass uh, groups or focused on an individual being, and they utilize two ultraviolet lasers to ionize the oxygen molecules in the air. Uh, it, t it takes three uh, photons to just basically, it ca when you pulse a laser at oxygen, the oxygen atom emits, uh, it loses an electron, thus becoming a positive ion, making the, uh, just making a nice ionic channel for the electric current to go through. So there's two ultraviolet lasers which create a conductive circuit, one going from the taser, one go coming back to the taser, which allows the operator of the device to actually just shoot out an electric current without the need of wires, which are used in an air taser, which either has a gunpowder charge or an air, a compressed carbon dioxide charge, to shoot out two electro electron electric prongs and thus uh, stun the subject. This instead uses, it's, it, it's kind of like a sci-fi ray gun. It just shoots out two rays of uh, ultraviolet radiation pointed at the target that ionizes the uh, oxygen. Then it shoots, uh, then it actually uses the conductive paths to shoot the current through there and basically uh, it, ha it has a taser effect on the people. The new technology, the tetanization, is a variant of that. It uses modulated current at a, 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 I don't know, I'm still not able to find a proper frequency, as I think that is also proprietary information, however I'm working on it, uh, <laughs> in my own little ways. Uh, it, it uses uh, modulated current to simulate uh, electrical impulses used by the nervous system to create a tetanizing effect. And for those who don't know, uh, tetanization basically is, it's the st stimulation of muscle tissue at a frequency which merges the individual muscle contractions into one uh, single sh uh, sustained contraction. So um, muscles, when they get electrical impulses between the nerve impulses, they tend to relax. A tetanizing effect, uh, it does not allow the muscle to relax. It just keeps the muscle clenched up. And with this ray, a person affected by this ray would not feel any pain if the ray is modulated properly. They would just freeze up. And if, they're, if when they were standing, if their body was balanced, they would not fall down. They would only fall down if it was used against them during running, if they're running or just off balance in any way. Now. Uh, some might wonder if, for example, this might be harmful to the eyes because it's an ultraviolet laser just shooting at you. However, it's not uh, shot at, s and at a such high amplitude so as to damage the retina, and damage to the skin is almost non-existent since all it does is just, it's, it ionizes the air. When it hits the skin, it's pretty much harmless. It's just like going to a tanning bed and lying there, but for a much briefer interval. There's also, the lasers themselves can be modulated uh, depending on the range. So for maximum range, which can be two kilometers, you would use a frequency of a, well, you, you would use a wavelength of 298 nanometers. So that extends the range to up to two kilometers. The smallest range is, one, is uh, when you're using the wavelength of 193 nanometers, the effective range is 100 meters. Um, for those of you who have a pen or a pencil, I can give you the patent number so you can go to uh, the United States Patent Office website and just get the entire text and diagrams of the patent. The Patent Office website is www.uspto.gov slash p-a-t-f-t and the patent number is... Uh, just repeat that again. Yes. Oh, it's u s p t o dot gov slash P-A-T-F-T, and the patent number is 5675103. It was issued out on October 7th, 1997, so this is relatively new technology. Uh, yes, uh, 5675103. It's pretty old. It's a seven-year-old patent. Um, it's, it's been actually applied for before that, but... 
well, that's not really relevant in this case. Uh, I'm just going to make this brief. I have another device that I, want, I want to talk about. It's not a device in and of itself as much as an effect of infrasound. And I'm not going to go into ra uh, rather technical details as um, infrasound is basically any noise that whose frequency is below that of uh, 20 hertz. So most people, when they, say, when they say infrasound, they utilize things up to, for example, as high as maybe a uh, 100 hertz. So scientifically, that's not considered infrasound. I still merge it with a group. Infrasound is used naturally by animals, uh, mainly mammals, like whales and uh, tigers and elephants to stun and shock prey. Or elephants, for example, use it as a defensive measure and also to communicate since uh, infrasound travels quite far and it tends to hug the ground. So it's good, it's very good for communications and since it's not, it's very hard to stop. As we all know, if we have someone in a party blasting music above you, the first thing you hear is the bass. That tends to penetrate more than anything else. So the lower the sound, the better the penetration. Uh, there are lethal frequencies which at a certain decibel rate can kill and those tend to be around the 7 hertz range, 3 to 7 hertz. Um, if you do it though, however, if it's done for a short amount of time, it can be used as a non-lethal weapon. It will just make the subject or the mark rather sick. However, the negative effect to using these weapons is that you can't exactly focus it too well and it tends to travel back onto the user. So the best way to utilize it is remote, as a remote technology, which uh, might be utilized by some military agencies. Uh, do, does anyone here want to say anything? Or do you want to well, I know uh, Leo has some, he's, he's got a couple things to follow up on. Yeah, uh, I'm basically finished. That's uh, the two major anti-personnel okay. non-lethal technologies, which are new, because okay. there's other uh, technologies which are more common. And that we know of maze, uh, there's foam that shoots out, which uh, in incapacitates the target because he's just all stuck together. But uh, those have been more talked about. So that's like presented two technologies which are not in the open as much as they should be since they're quite interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, and I'm going to invite Leo up here to speak. Uh, uh, no, actually, uh, no, uh, we got uh, the nod, we're out of time. They right. said, get out! You and say something uh, or no? Nah. No, well, no, questions. if there's any, uh, yeah, if there's if there's any, any questions, questions, just come on uh, up. Yes, you wanna, yeah, you can actually come up and uh, give yeah, we'll you the mic. Well, everyone except for Gray, she's oh, there's dangerous. there's a mic on there. Uh, pardon me, uh, could you get the mic on? No, 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 no just come on up to us. Uh, can one of the three of you set up a website, maybe you've already got a website, where the three of you can put a whole bunch of URLs and stuff down? All right, uh, well. You together, just yeah, pick one, okay. one of you right now. Uh, give us yeah. one of your websites. All right, the, 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 so for the people who are going to be listening to the recordings, the uh, question is if we have a website where we can put all these things. I'm sure Gonzo would like to answer yeah, that my question. Site. All right, uh, you can visit my site. It's just a little bit of everything. Reprimandmag.com. R-E-P-R-I-M-A-N-D-M-A-G.com. Uh, yeah, that's Reprimand Magazine. And that's probably the best plug my site's ever gotten. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, all right, uh, so that's it. Yeah, so, uh, no, well, thanks for, uh, for showing up. No. All right, thank you. Uh, you've been a great audience, and we're going to step off the stage now and make way for the simultaneous broadcast of the uh, social engineering right. panel. Oh, we have to get downstairs. Oh, seven minutes?